Our media follower. Uh, well, I got a line, but my mom's saying that, like, May 71 has code, but you can use the word. So I choose that, and I don't think what I find on the line. I look at the line I'm now, I just got it in my phone. It's just like a straight line. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not sure what I got in there, because it's well, probably. Or sometimes not. Like, I grabbed it on my phone, and it doesn't. It's not something that you can do, I don't know. Oh, that's what I see. Good morning. I might have done the function. I think that's my problem too. What do I do? Pass on. Does Coach, does Chase Python see Coach on? Is there a math library for Python? I think it's yeah, 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 yeah. 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 math. Then when I was running input maps, I did math, but I chose Python. Look at that, it's transcribing everything you guys are talking about. Yeah. <laughs> 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 like, Python publishes letters. I'm so bad at coding, or in this class, like, I don't understand how anything is writing. If there was an example code, I would have no idea. Okay. Don't act much of it. Well, you're most welcome. Uh, I wish it were possible that I could be speaking to you in person uh, another year, perhaps. Um, when Dr. Thomas and I first met, uh, I was a young professor at Georgia Tech. And one of the things I loved about Georgia Tech was the enthusiasm of some of the graduate students, in particular now Professor Thomas. Um, that they would share ideas in the hallway in the lounge and somebody would discover something new and they'd excitedly go and tell everybody else about it. And so one of the things I love doing is sharing ideas. And the idea I want to share today is, I'll give this talk a title, if it is worth proving, dot, 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 dot. And the idea I want to explore is that sometimes 
theorems, ideas are, are provable, but if they are worth proving, then it's worth proving them in more than one distinct way. And I want to give some examples of that. And the, the playground I'll use for that, I think, is countability. Now, I understand that uh, Professor Thomas has, has talked about countability and uncountability, but didn't show you, I believe, that the rationals are countable. So in the 1870s, I believe, So Cantor showed the rationals are what he called countable. But I want to discuss what that means. So we could look at the definition. So the definition would be there's a bijection between the natural numbers, which for this talk will include zero. I think of the natural numbers as the numbers that count things. So for example, they could count the number of oranges in my pocket. And at the moment, I have no oranges in my pocket, so I need zero to be a natural number. So a bijection between the natural numbers, and we're going to look at just the positive rationals And let's do the positive rationals because then I can just insist that A and B are greater than zero. And this was a surprising theorem. Infinity is a pretty big idea and it's a very confusing idea. And I think it's fair to say that really mathematicians don't understand infinity at all well. We understand some small infinities, reasonably well, but once you get to bigger infinities, uh, there's lots and lots of open questions, and in some sense, there are lots and lots of unsolvable questions. So this was pretty surprising. Mathematicians didn't take to Cantor's ideas immediately. In fact, many of them thought he was crazy, thought he was a crank. He eventually ended up having severe mental health issues, and uh, some of this is probably because he asked questions that were too hard for people to answer. But he did have this amazing theorem. So here is Cantor's proof, or rather here is why, here is what we want to prove. So we want to list all the rationals as R0, R1, Rn, and so on, so that every rational Every positive rational is in the list precisely once. Because then, to get our bijection from the natural numbers, to get our bijection from the natural numbers to the positive rationals, define f of n is equal to r sub n. And we've really just restated the problem. Instead of talking about bijections, we've talked about creating a list that has everything in it. And it was clear to mathematicians of his time that 
there are more rational numbers than there are integers. Right? You've got the integers 0, 1, 2, and they plot along slowly towards infinity. But between any pair of integers, we've got infinitely many rational numbers. Surely the set of rationals should be much bigger. So it was rather surprising when, when Cantor was able to show that he could list the set of all rational numbers. So Cantor showed that the sizes were the same, meaning that there exists a bijection from one set to the other. And I want to show you his construction, because it's really rather lovely. So what Cantor did is he looked at the positive quadrant of the plane. And he looked at the points with integer coordinates. And he identified the point AB with the rational number A over B. And he observed that if he if we look at this point first and then take diagonals, so let's get another color here. and we list all the points on each diagonal in order, we'll eventually exhaust all of the points in the upper quadrant. <coughs> so we start with one, one, and then we, we go to 1, 2, 2, 1, 1, 3, 2, 2, 3, 1, 1, 4, 2, 3, 3, 2, 4, 1, etc. And then we write these as fractions, so it's 1 over 1, 1 over 2, 2 over 1. Let me actually write what I say. 2 over 1, 1 over 3, 2 over 2, 3 over 1. And so every fraction will be in this list. But Unfortunately, it'll, it'll appear more than once. So what Cantor said then is, OK, well, let's just cross out the fractions that appear more than once, that appear second time or more. So we'll cross out 2 over 2. When we get to 4 over 2, 3 over 3, 2 over 3, we'll cross out 3 in a row, in fact. 
and we'll shuffle all the fractions along and we'll get a new list. And in this beautiful way, Cantor showed that the rationals could be listed. In other words, that they are countable. The size of the rationals is the same as the size of the natural numbers. Now, I have long thought that uh, when something is true, there are often many reasons for it to be true. Just because we have one way of doing something doesn't mean that is the only way or even the best way. Uh, for example, if you want to compute the Fibonacci numbers, one way of doing it is from the bottom up, starting with 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, and so on, until you get to the Fibonacci number you want. But if I ask you for the 10 to the 3,000th Fibonacci number and say, I only want the, the last five digits, that would be a really bad way of doing it. Uh, I'm in the, in the middle of writing a paper at the moment on a, a pedagogical paper on, on how to do precisely that task. So with this, we have this beautiful result that, that's very surprising when you first see it, that there are exactly the same number of rationals as there are natural numbers. So my motto is if it's worth proving, it's worth proving in more than one way. So I understand that you're being introduced to some of the ideas of proof in the, in the course you're currently enrolled in. And sometimes we think, oh, there's only one way of proving this. We're going to see several ways of proving this. Uh, I think I'll probably get through three distinct proofs. So in order to motivate the third proof a little bit, I'm going to ask a question. What is the hundredth rational in Cantor's list? And what is the 10 to the 3,000th rational in Cantor's list? Okay. The first question, I'm pretty sure that if you get bored in my talk, you could sit down, you could actually construct the first 100 elements of the list and figure out what the 10 to, 10 to the tooth, the, the hundredth rational is. I am reasonably confident that mankind, humanity, will never be able to compute the second answer. Even with quantum computing. Quantum computing might make it less infeasible, but it's still really beyond my understanding of how to compute. And I think I have a pretty good understanding of it. Okay, so the third proof will actually have a different list. It'll be a different order, and it's possible to go away and compute the 10 to the 3,000th rational. So there, that we will see that there is a benefit to doing this in a different way. We can actually compute things. But let's give a second proof. So the second 
approve. So this is a different listing. And I, I want to emphasize that each of the lists that I give you will be different. So it doesn't mean that if we can compute something in one of them, we can compute something in the others. So a different listing. So let's consider the function which takes a pair of positive integers and maps it to 2 to the a, 3 to the b. And so we can now take any fraction we like. But here we'll pick A over B in lowest terms. And this gives a bijection between the positive rationals and a subset of the natural numbers. Not every natural number can be written as a power of 2 times a power of 3. the subset S. So S is a subset of the natural numbers. So S is equal to S0 less than S1 less than S2. And we'll define uh, F mapping Q to N by F of A over B is equal to I such that SI is equal to 2 to the A, 3 to the B. So it's a slightly more complicated construction, but it, it really is a very, very different feeling construction than Cantor's original method. So let's ask ourselves what this construction gets for us. Well, firstly, It shows there are two fundamentally different ways to list
the positive rationals. The listings are very different. And if you, if you start playing around with them, uh, you'll see that the structure of the two lists is, uh, they're completely different from each other. One of the things I, I particularly like about this method, and, and I'm, I'm sorry to say, I don't know who this method is due to. I first learned it from Chris Leonard, who Professor Thomas may remember when, from when he was a visitor at Georgia Tech in the, uh, I think 1996, the year of the Olympics. Um, but one of the nice things about it is we can replace two by alpha greater than one and replace three by beta greater than one, where alpha and beta uh, let's say are not I'm going to say they're not too related uh, what I mean is there isn't an algebraic equation involving them both and Then instead of using 2 to the a, 3 to the b, we can use alpha to the a, beta to the b, and we can use this to generate a listing of, of q plus. And any different pairs, alpha and beta, modulo some obvious things. Basically, if you choose different alpha and beta, you'll get a different listing. So this means we can construct uncountably many different listings of this countable set. Uh, remember, uncountable really means very much bigger than the rationals. But I'm pretty sure that we'll never know the 10 to the 3,000th rational in this listing either. So I'm going to pause there and ask if there are any questions or, or clarifications that I need to give. He's good with questions. He answered all of mine. Incessant questions. Do, do alpha and beta have to be integers for this to work, or can they be any? No, they can be real numbers. Any real number, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so the idea is you don't want alpha to the k equal beta to the n for any k and n in the integers, because then you can get collisions. So they, they have to not satisfy certain types of algebraic relations, but modulo that, any choice of alpha and beta will work. So we have some restrictions, but you could use uh, square root of 2 and square root of 3, for example. All you have to be able to do is to get that the list of values you create are a subset of the reals, which has certain types of what they call order type, so that you can read them off in order, and the conditions I've stated will do that for you. Go ahead. If alpha and beta can be the real numbers, then can they be greater than zero, or do they have to be greater than one? The greater than one is here to ensure that you can list them in order. If you have one of them less than zero, less, sorry, between zero and one, then you end up with getting a whole bunch of the values of alpha to the a, beta to the b, 
in the interval 0, 1, and you can't list them in increasing order. So the, the greater than 1 is just a, a convenient uh, assumption here to make things work nicely. Those are great questions. I, I particularly like the one about do they have to be greater than, can they be greater than zero? Okay, so I know this was advertised as not being a talk about research. Uh, it is a talk about research in not necessarily recent research, but about 20 years ago, uh, my mentor, uh, Herb Wilf, and I wrote a paper about hyperbinary partitions, whatever they are. And it turned out that some of the results in the paper were already known. And this is a very depressing thing for a mathematician because you spend all your time proving these lovely theorems and then you find out that uh, somebody beat you to the punch a few years earlier and it was published in an obscure journal that nobody ever read so you didn't know of its existence. But along the way, we realized that in our paper, we had uh, what mathematicians call a corollary. We, we proved some nice results. And then as a nice side benefit, we, we realized we could show something nice. And so we, we took the opportunity to write an expository paper uh, for the American Mathematical Monthly. Uh, those of you who are math majors, the monthly is the best math publication I know of. It's read by more people than any other journal by a lot. The quality of exposition is extraordinarily high. And if you publish there, people actually read your work. So uh, the paper I'm going to talk about is one of my most cited papers. Um, and and it's a, a nice example of of when something goes wrong, don't let it, don't let life just kick you in the teeth, stand up and, and beat back. So the paper, if you would like to, uh, I can probably actually send uh, Professor Thomas a copy of this. Uh, the paper is called Recounting the Rationals. And in it, we present a tree, uh, which we call the tree of all fractions. Um, people have subsequently started calling it the Culkin Wolf tree, and I, I don't like that notation. Um, I love that somebody thinks that they should name something after me, but we weren't the first people to introduce this tree. We happen to be the people who wrote about it in the form where it gets read most. But other people had looked at this tree before we had, and so I still like to think of it as the tree of all fractions. It's more descriptive anyway. So, let's see, a tree. So, in case some of you don't know what a tree is, um, for me it is a complete binary tree in this instance so it looks like following Every node has two children. Of course, trees grow downwards for mathematicians. So we have a root node at the top, 
and every every node has two children. So this is level zero, level one, level two, and so on. And so the nth level has twice as many nodes as the level above. And so a simple proof by induction will show that the nth level has two to the n nodes on it. And we're going to label these, these nodes. And the labels we're going to use will be positive rational numbers. And we'll start with 1 over 1 at the top. And then the next level will have 1 over 2 and 2 over 1. And I need to tell you how to generate these labels. And the way to generate the labels, if, if we have a node labeled A over B, then the children will be A over A plus B and A plus B over B. <laughs> so let's make some observations here. First, let's note that if we have a node A over B, and A over B happens to be in lowest terms, then the, ch the child, the left child, and the right child will both be in lowest terms as well. Secondly, if we look at a rational number, A over B, well, if it's equal to 1, we know it's the top node of the tree. But if it is less than 1, it arises as the left child of A over B minus A, because when we take the left child of A over B minus A, we get A over B. Similarly, if it's greater than 1, we know it's a right child and we can identify its parent.
So we can show that every label on the tree is in lowest terms, and the proof is by induction on the levels of the tree. And we can see that every positive fraction appears at least once, and actually at most once as well. So that means exactly once. As a label. And when I'm giving this talk to a non-mathematical audience, I like to say this is a, a, a very special proof technique. I call it proof by your mama. Your mama appeared exactly once in the tree, therefore you appear exactly once in the tree. You can tell the parent of a node, and that parent appeared exactly once because it came earlier in the tree, therefore you appear exactly once in the tree. So there's, there's a new proof technique that you will probably never have a chance to use again. Okay, so that's not quite what we were after, though, right? This shows that every label is on the tree. Sorry, every rational, every positive rational is a label exactly once on the tree. So now we, we read along the levels. So here's the tree. And we see that the fractions that we read are one over one, one over two, two over one, 1 over 3, 3 over 2, 2 over 3, 3 over 1, 1 over 4, 4 over 3. And this one will be 3 over 5, 5 over 2, and so on. And this gives us another listing of Q plus, so it gives us a third, very different proof that the rational is accountable. Now, uh, I want you to take a look at that listing that's at the top of the board. And can any, anybody spot any patterns there that might be interesting? Uh, I see yeah. a hand raised. Uh, it looks like um, every, how to say this, two to the nth term is one over n. Ah, nice. One over Every n. two to the nth term is one over n. Nice. Uh, 
and and we need to take some some care here. It's not two to the nth term. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, it is eight. It's it's uh, one over n plus one, I think. But there is a pattern there to be seen. Yes. Any other patterns? So, in the interest of time, I'm going to show you a pattern. The denominators of one fraction are the numerator of the following fraction. So 1 over 1 is followed by 1 over 2, is followed by 2 over 1, is followed by 1 over 3. So the listing is of the form a n over a n plus one, where a is the sequence one, one, two, one, three, two, three, one, four, three, five. And so on. If we if we look at ratios of consecutive terms in this sequence, that generates our listing. In in fact, it was when we noticed this that Herb and I, our eyes popped, and we said, "Wow, that's gorgeous," because it turns out. It turns out that the sequence of values of a n satisfies a pair of recurrences, namely that the ones with odd positions, a 2n plus 1, are the same one halfway back, a n. And the sequence of even positions are the sum of the two terms halfway back, a n plus a n minus 1. And so this means that in order to compute a 100, you only have to compute A50 and A49. And to compute A50 and A49, you only have to compute a couple of values further back, and to compute those a couple of values further back. And if you're careful about it, you can do this in a nice way with matrix multiplication. And to compute uh, the 2 to the nth term will require n matrix multiplications. So it's fairly cheap to do. So we can compute A n for reasonably large n, say I have done n equals uh, 10 to the 30,000 and that takes seconds. It's very quick.
So in this listing, we can compute things in what I like to call realistic time that we cannot for the other listings. Now, that looks like a nice pat finished uh, way to end, but I will say that there are open questions. And I will send Professor Thomas a list of some questions regarding this uh, that I think are quite interesting. Uh, in particular, if we look at the list, eight comes in a n as a value before seven does. So let me write this question. How can we how can we determine which values So I'll leave it with that question. We can list which order which order the integers appear in. The integer each integer, each positive integer appears in this list infinitely many times. So let's just look at the first time eight appears, the first time seven appears, seven comes in after eight does. Uh, I understand why eight appears early. I don't understand why seven appears late. So gave a good understanding of which order the integers appear in. And with that, I will say thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Collins. I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Could you repeat it? You mentioned that uh, eight, you know why eight appears? Yes. Why eight? Uh, Fibonacci numbers appear very early. I, and there is a teaser for you. They may not know. I'll, I'll tell. So the Fibonacci numbers are a very famous sequence of integers. Uh, they're very, very well studied. Um, each each number is the sum of the previous two in the sequence, and there are very good reasons why the Fibonacci numbers appear as values of an early. So that's why I say I understand why eight appears early. I understand less why which numbers appear late. Other questions? Yeah, I So, Dr. Coughlin, we know that you have a class to go to. If they have other questions, can they email you? Absolutely. All right. Please feel free to give them my email address. It's my last name at clemson.edu. I'll send it out. And I will send you some materials about this that you can distribute to them for their reading pleasure later. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome.